Hey, um, I'd like to thank the organisers for the invitation here um, and for the uh, general mar marvellous environment and setting they put us in. I didn't think I want to thank them for scheduling me to speak in the morning straight after the conference dinner, but nobody's perfect. <laughs> Okay, there's a kind of narrative about thinking about the nature of uh, the asymmetry in time, which um, you can caricature as, as saying something like this. It's effectively a, a two-level view of the problem. A pen somewhere. And the view goes something like this. We've got fundamental physics... Which, you know, if we're being really careful about it, we mean, you know, something like the standard model or our preferred post-standard model physics. In reality, we probably mean something, in, you know, in the practical case that we think about, we probably mean something like ordinary quantum mechanics or maybe even uh, something like the Hamiltonian dynamical systems that David was using. But in any case, we mean something that's putatively supposed to be the physics of the micro-constituents of the world and which is time reversal invariant and shows no particular direction of time. And then we have the observed world, which is chock full of various kinds of observed asymmetries. It's got thermodynamic asymmetries, it's got radiative asymmetries, it's got causal psychological asymmetries, blah, blah, blah. And so the general way we tend to set the problem up is um, that we say, okay, we have a contradiction between what our physics says, which is that the world is time reverse invariant, and what we see around us, which says it isn't. And I want to suggest the advantages of a slightly more nuanced way of thinking about the problem, because, of course, it's really not the case that all of physics, or even most of physics, or even very much of physics, frankly, is this kind of thing. In the middle, we have a huge range of what you might call you know, mid-level dynamical systems, governed by mid-level dynamical equations. And I'm thinking of you know, the, the, the equations of fluid dynamics. I'm thinking of something like the Boltzmann equation that governs dilute gases and a bunch of similar systems. I'm thinking of something like the Langevin equation or the Fokker-Planck equation that governs uh, Brownian motion. I'm thinking of something like the equations of radio radioactive decay or master equations. In principle, I suppose I'm thinking about uh, all the various equations and um, rules of the higher sciences in general, but we can confine our attention here uh, just to the sort of panoply of different equations and, and systems we study in physics. We actually, in physics, have this kind of complete plethora of different dynamical systems governed by a whole bunch of different sorts of laws. And if you look at those mid-level laws, you find, by no means universally, but to a large extent, they actually have a whole bunch of properties which aren't shared by the fundamental physics. Um, so, in general, we find, in particular, two features of the sort of mid-level dynamical laws we run into. Generally speaking, they tend to have a lack of time symmetry. And, by, um, and it's worth just pausing on what that means for a second, because sometimes, at, at this point, one always has to add a caveat to the effect, well, you know, technically the standard model doesn't have that either, but it has CPT symmetry, blah, blah, blah. Um, and it's, it's worth pausing on why, why something like that doesn't count. I mean, theories at this kind of uh, middle level, they generally, they, they don't have, you know, they lack a formal time symmetry, time reversal symmetry, <coughs> But more seriously, they're generally irreversible, which is to say that their, their dynamical maps are many to one, either in the literal sense that they take multiple initial states to the same later state, or in the sense that they take multiple different initial states to final states that get closer and closer together so that to any given grain of resolution it might as well be taken into the final state. And in fact, frequently they're not just irreversible. In general, they have attractors. They have particular points in their state space so that a whole bunch of states, you know, all the states which share the same conserved quantities as that, as that attractor end up at that attractor and can be shown to do so inside the equations of those theories. 
And also, somewhat less importantly, for my purposes, but not irrelevantly, they tend to be probabilistic. Which is to say, maybe they're, sometimes they have stochastic equations. Sometimes they're equations for the evolution of, of classical probability distributions. Quantum mechanically, they tend to be equations for the evolution of mixed states. And in general, we tend to get back to determinism with these kind of theories, particularly when we're talking about systems with a lot of degrees of freedom, only in kind of the law of large numbers level. So you know, when, when, when we, something like the Boltzmann equation for a quantum mechanical system, we'll do as an example, we characteristically set that out uh, probabilistically. We'll get out a non-probabilistic equation at the end of the process because we're looking at um, uh, a system so large that we can uh, decide that the, that the probabilistic variations can be ignored. That's not always the case. Um, you know, Boltzmann famously derived the classical Boltzmann equation direct as a frequency equation without going for a probability route, but it, it tends to be the, the general pattern. Okay, so pause a second. Um, obviously, I'm putting, put, putting aside for the moment what the link between all of this is and the underlying microphysics. We'll come back to that. Pause for a second and just ask how we go about treating the past and the future in a system governed by these kind of laws. So if you think about how you would go about uh, making claims about the past and the future in a theory determined by reversible dynamical laws, there's going to be a fairly obvious symmetry. The way you learn about the future is you look at what the present state is, you turn the handle of the dynamics, out comes a prediction about the future state, and then you check the prediction against the experiment. How does the theory make claims about the past? Pretty much the same. You do it by retrodiction. You plug in the present state, you run the dynamical equation backwards, that tells you what the past state is supposed to be, and then you compare with what it actually was. And there's a reason we say retrodiction, this is a slight neologism, um, really to suggest we're doing the same kind of thing as a prediction. If you've got irreversible dynamical processes, then um, prediction is going to be a similar kind of game. Uh, the theory, you, you, put, you plug in the present state of the world, outcomes, let's say, a probability distribution over future states of the world, perhaps, but something determinate, something that doesn't plug in subjectivity or ignorance, something that just, tell, just makes a, a possibly probabilistic prediction about the future, and we check the prediction. We're not in a position to do that for anything irreversible in general, because the, this, this links to the point that Bill Unruh made yesterday, the present state is typically not going to univocally determine a past state. Um, but it could be that the, the dynamics are deterministic, but it has irreversibility. It could well be that the dynamics is probabilistic um, and just isn't really in the business of telling us anything about what the past looked like. So what do we do there? Um, so Bob Wald mentioned this yesterday again. We kind of guess and check. At the crudest level, we take a guess as to what looks like a kind of reasonable early state. We evolve forward and see what that would look like now. We compare and see what it actually does look like um, and we sort of iterate that process. We want to be slightly more careful, slightly more systematic, slightly more formal about that. We put something like a, a Bayesian prior distribution over, over our collection of initial states. Um, we use that Bayesian prior to um, work out a probability distribution over possible present states. We conditionalize on the actual present state and see where that leaves us. Call, I mean, call that process historical in inference and distinguish it sharply from retrodiction. It's our normal means by which we learn about the past in these kind of theories. And it's worth noticing, I mean, the, the, the cases where we genuinely use retrodiction are kind of worth reminding ourselves of just to see the contrast. If we want to work out... You know, if you want to work out the dates of some eclipse that some, that's mentioned in some 5th century um, BC history, we really do do that in the same way we work out when the eclipses are going to be next century. We really do just run the equations of the solar system backwards. But it's very much the exception that proves the rule. But well, we do take tidal, tidal friction for the moon. It's a, it's a slight correction to the thing. Right, good. So even there, we're not, we're not there. Yeah, yeah. 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 But I suppose it, perhaps just to pause on that example because it's interesting. I mean, even there, I guess, um, the equations aren't formally time reversal symmetric there, but on the time scales we're running them, we can still, um, we can, we can still retrodict them. We can still just directly 
predict back. It's getting it more, it, we'd, we'd be in more trouble if we had some system where, say, the, the, the frictional forces are uh, dominant enough that over the time scales we're interested in, the system is going to have stopped. So a whole bunch of different states are going to have come back. And in that situation, it's going to fail us entirely. OK, so observe, if we, um, it's not particularly mysterious um, in a world that were hypothetically really governed exactly by laws of this kind of character. It'd be pretty unsurprising that we had a whole bunch of uh, psychological asymmetries, causal asymmetries, entropic asymmetries. You, you know, you, if, if your underlying physics contains a whole bunch of um, irreversibility and violation of time and universal invariance, you'd expect that the observed world is going to have those features. So that suggests a sort of different way of setting up the problem from, of uh, asymmetry in time from the way it's normally set up. To so go back to... Oh yeah, go back here. Typically, we tend to say, um, OK, how do we reconcile this level with this level? Uh, OK, so suggestion as a friendly amendment to that way of thinking um, there are some advantages in keeping the discussion inside um, the equations of the physics. L look at the reconciling of these levels. If you can sort that out, this step starts looking rather easier, rather, rather more tractable. Why do I suggest that as a way of proceeding? Um, so three reasons, and, and that, perhaps the three reasons would also suggest something about why the distinction is even interesting or worth thinking about. One is just division of labor. Um, it's quite a job to say, OK, how am I going to reconcile the microscopic physics of the world with the fact that I remember the past and not the future? Um, there are so many different layers and bits of science filtering into that kind of story that trying to do that whole thing all in one go is inevitably uh, involves sort of radically simplifying models and dynamical assumptions we're not remotely in a position to check. Um, to work out, you know, to, to, to imagine that we can outsource the problem of understanding why we remember the, um, the past and not the future to, re to, to those with relevant expertise in, in memory and cognition um, and evolution and so forth, while handing them on a plate a whole bunch of underlying physics that has, that, that has time irreversibility in it already, um, looks a bit more tractable than trying to do the whole thing ourselves. That's the first thought. Um, the second thought is we need to understand it anyway. Um, an account of why we remember the past and not the future, or an account of uh, you know, why ice melts in qualitative terms, um, that doesn't also tell us quantitatively why it is, how it is that we, that we can have you know, the Langevin equation or something um, holding uh, compatibly with our microscopic physics, hasn't finished the job. Conversely, if we, if we can do it, if we do have a grip of how we reconcile our sort of middle level irreversible dynamical um, uh, systems with our bottom level reversible dynamical systems, we'll get, this, we'll, we'll get a lot of the rest more or less for free. That's the second reason. Third reason, and this is the one I want to dwell on here, really, um, there's something funny about saying that it's a deep mystery how we can reconcile time, re uh, time reversible microphysics with time irreversible um, mesophysics. In one sense, it is a mystery. Um, in one sense, we can prove a whole bunch of things that say somehow this couldn't possibly be compatible. Uh, how, can it possi how can you possibly have got a time asymmetric ingredient in, etc.? But at the other level, mostly we don't get our mid-level dynamical um, physics purely from phenomenology, purely from experiment. To a very large extent, we actually do derive it from the microphysics. Or perhaps to avoid begging the question, we at least construct it um, from the microphysics. We have a whole bunch of thoroughly used and highly successful techniques for starting with micro-level physics and getting out equations governing the higher level of the physics. In fact, the great bulk of what we call the evidence for our low-level physics is actually mediated through this kind of process. And we don't just get the qualitative form out, we actually get the coefficients. It's something like the Oh, I know, the, the, the decay rates of, of, of particles or something, those are, those are governed by a time irreversible equation, a decay equation, but we get that equation out from quantum field theory and we get out the decay coefficient while doing it. So at some level, we clearly know how to do this, or at least we have a trick that very reliably works, and which works um, 
in the philosopher's sense, projectably um, at two levels. It, it, it allows us to work out dynamical equations which continue to be right in multiple different systems. And the fact that we can do this also turns out to be projectable. If we take, an, if we take a novel physical system where we haven't yet tried to work out what the macrodynamics are, and we use the kind of techniques of physics, we tend to get out things that work. So that ought to suggest that if we want to understand where the time asymmetry comes into physics, we ought to be looking at how we, what, what, what ingredient we're actually putting in in our math when we try to get out the Langevin equation or the radioactive decay equation or any of these bunch of things. And indeed, that had better turn out to be a sanity check on extant claims of where the asymmetry is. So if, the, um, if for instance, the claim is that the way we should understand the asymmetry is specifically in a low entropy boundary condition, we ought to be able to see how it is that that low entropy boundary condition, perhaps mediated, perhaps indirectly, um, underpins whatever is actually being put into our derivational process to get out the Fokker-Planck equation and whatever from our microphysics. Okay, so that moves me on to the second half of what I want to talk about. Let's actually have a look at that in a little bit more detail uh, and see what's going on. And I'm still going to be very qualitative, um, but quick, I mean, quick caveat, the world of deriving higher level dynamical equations from lower level dynamical equations is enormously wide and varied um, I only know small corners of it. There's a sense in which, like I say, it's the great bulk of physics. Um, so pretty much any generality is going to be um, oversimplified there. So I'm, l l let's stipulate I'm talking about a certain subclass of such processes. That, that subclass is not empty. Um, I conjecturally, I'd say that subclass contains an awful lot of what we do, but I do, it's not particularly my brief to say it covers everything here. And there's the usual unavoidable caveat, particularly for this side of audience, of um, uh, you know, having to apologize to, for telling at least some members of the audience things that they know several dozen times better than I do anyway. All right, so here's a generic model of how we might think about things. That, uh, for, to, a, to a large extent, what we are doing in the process of getting out higher level physics is some kind of process of coarse graining. And what I mean is we've got something like this. At the kinematic level, here's the state space of the low level theory. <laughs> And here's the state space of the high-level theory. And we have what you might call a reduction map that takes us from points of the low-level theory to points of the high-level theory. And that map is typically going to be many to one. It's going to take a whole bunch of low-level states and associate them with a single high-level state. And the paradigmatic example of this is something like the way we do fluid or gas dynamics. So the low-level theory, at least classically, is going to be the Hamiltonian dynamics of 10 to the 23-point particles interacting under some force laws. Um, and the high-level theory is going to uh, be, yeah, the st states in the high-level theory are going to be specified by you know, giving the pressure and density and velocity of the gas averaged over one, micron, one cubic micron cells. So that's still a large dimensional space, but it's a lot smaller than the previous split, um, setup. A whole bunch of different particle configurations are going to be associated to um, a given a, a single fluid configuration. And it's going to follow, of course, again, just, just from the fact you define that rule, that if I take a trajectory defined by the low-level dynamics, that trajectory is going to be mapped to some path in the high-level theory. OK. so. Pause a second and ask what kind of reduction maps we might want to study, um, what, what, how we might decide to define such ones. So if we move outside the particular case of the fluid I've given and ask generally how might we try to set up high-level, low-level correspondences in physics, there's a kind of slightly unfortunate tendency at this point to go into pragmatics and, and, and epistemology. And sometimes you'll hear people say that what we're doing when we go from the low level to the high level is we're keeping only those features of the system that we're interested in and discarding those that don't interest us. So sometimes people will, will say, you know, we're not interested in the precise positions of the gas, we just want to know, um, it's, it, you know it, its bulk state. Okay, claim, that isn't going to work. Uh, here's a quick, quick way of seeing that. I'm actually really not very interested in the cubic micron of gas right over there in that corner. In fact, I'm not really very interested in the gas in this room at all. 
Um, I have no interest in studying it. I could perfectly happily go for the rest of my life knowing nothing about it. More or less so could the rest of us. Um, it's still true <laughs> that, it's, that its dynamics is governed by the, by the equations of fluid dynamics. That generality is no less true because I don't care about it. Conversely, I'm actually quite interested in, the, in what the stock market looks like tomorrow. Um, I would love to be able to do a um, dynamical reduction where I coarse-grained over everything except the leading numbers in the stock market tomorrow and, and, and kept those. But however fascinated I might be on that, I, I, it, I, don't, I can't do it. What's going on there is that we're not, we're not interested actually in situations where um, the high-level theory is defined by the degrees of freedom we're interested in. Um, we're actually in the business of saying, when is the high-level theory defined by degrees of freedom for which we can write down autonomous dynamical rules? And what I mean by that is, look at the trajectory here, which is the image of a trajectory here. This, this theory has dynamics, so it determines trajectories. Every trajectory here determines a trajectory here. But there's no a priori guarantee um, that if I have, for instance, uh, another trajectory here, that trajectory isn't mapped onto something like this, something which matches the first trajectory for a while and then diverges. Which is to say there's absolutely no guarantee um, that in moving from the low level to the high level, I haven't um, discarded some information which is actually necessary to predict the future evolution of the high, high level state. So I have something that you can call a dynamical reduction process when I, when I actually have not just the kinematics but the dynamics um, uh, you know, being robust at the high level. That doesn't need to happen, um, but often it does happen. Um, and in particular, um, often it'll happen at levels that are actually robust against the fine, grain, fine details of how I define the reduction map as well. I, I, I talked about my gas on cubic micron cells, but clearly I could have chosen 10 microns or a half micron. Why should that ever work? That's kind of surprising, isn't it? I mean, step, step back from the fact that physics works and ask how is it that we can do um, equations for just a small number of degrees of freedom that are autonomous, that um, can be worked out while discarding the information about the other degrees of freedom. You know, I mean, as with the stock market case, it's, it's not generally true that that's right. Generally, we can't just pick a subset of the degrees of freedom and, and, and work out what they do. Okay, and, if you, and I, th I think very, very broadly, and you know, page two is a very broad brush, we can kind of sort of see two reasons why that happens in reduction. Um, sometimes it happens because there really is a dynamical decoupling of some degrees of freedom from others. And generally that happens when we've got a symmetry of some kind in play. So it really is the case that um, you know, un under appropriate approximations, the center of mass degree of freedom of the Earth decouples from the, from, from the remaining degrees of freedom of the Earth. And so I really can treat the, uh, write, write down an evolution equation for the center of mass of the Earth treated as a point with just three degrees of freedom. Even that's not perfect, but it's not um, because you know, the gravitational field variation is, sharp, is, is, is fast on scales comparable to the length of the Earth, I'm going to have trouble. Um, but to a first approximation, I can do it. And I can do it basically because, um, you know, because the symmetry structure of the dynamics lets me decouple them. So sometimes that happens. Much more usually, what's going on, as, as in, for instance, the gas, what's going on is not that there's a complete decoupling of this kind. It's that the residual degrees of freedom, the ones I'm discarding by this move, are very large in number and very random in the, de in the little details of their dynamics. And each one of them is contributing only to a very small extent to the um, ov overall dynamics. So that I can basically do a statistical trick. I can pretty, rather than have to keep track um, of them in bulk, I can kind of just keep track of their statistical averages. I, 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 I can sum all that stuff up. Um, and get a sort of and, and, and treat the whole thing as a sort of generalized noise term. And you see this in some of the way one actually derives um, these kind of equations in detail. What, what one often does, sometimes you hear the term in randomization, posit, sometimes you, you call it a projection, is instead of working out the, the, the fine grained dynamics directly, we'll, um, we'll, we'll kind of choose a representative, really random point in our space of possible states. We'll evolve that state forward a little bit will project it onto um, the, um, the sort of the, the characteristic fairly randomized point, and we'll keep doing that. So the, using that method is kind of implicitly taking a bet that actually um, the, those fine-grained details don't matter. I really can treat them as a kind of average noise. OK, um, and that sounds great, but 
there's a sense which we know that that can't really be true. Thanks. And the sense is the following, of course, that if it really was the case um, that we had dynamical reduction of this kind at, in an exact way, if it really was the case that every dynamical trajectory in the low-level theory mapped onto the high-level de- um, theory in such a way as there was a completely accurate, robust, um, reduced dynamics for the high-level theory, then if the dynamics of the low-level theory is time-reversal invariant, the dynamics of the high-level theory had better be time-reversal invariant as well. And it isn't. So something broke. Something went wrong. And if we look at what went wrong, um, if we actually, actually look at the mathematics of what we're doing here, what's going wrong is that it's not true that any old um, distribution of the microscopic degrees of freedom with such and such average will behave in such and such a way. There will be ways of tuning and setting up the microscopic degrees of freedom where they're aligned in just the right way that they'll break our assumptions about how the dynamics is going to work. I mean, let me give you a, a little example here, which is not a statistical mechanical one, just for the sake of thinking about generality. Think about um, radioactive decay quantum mechanically. Um, I t- if, if I take a, you know, a, a particle on my desk that is in fact not decayed, and I evolve it forward, it will evolve into a superposition of the undecayed particle and a whole bunch of decayed products at different times. If I try evolving backwards, I'll erroneously predict that um, the system will do a time reversal of a decay if I just use Schrodinger's equation. Why, how do I actually allow, um, reconcile that with the fact that the particle is just sitting on my desk undecayed? The answer is that the full equations of the decay include, the, if, if I time reverse them, include the time reverse of all of those decay product states. They're all coming in at just the right amplitudes and just the right phases, but they're continually, ca- continually cancelling out the decay terms that are being produced from the backward evolution of the undecayed term. And it's because of that, be- of, of that setup being aligned just right, in Everettian terms, it's because of all, all, all the branches going back into time are interfering in just the right way, um, that, I don't, that, that I get the wrong answer if I try to predict using, you know, retrodict using the normal radioactive decay equations. There's the, it, 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 more or less any generic old state of the way the fields could be wouldn't do this, but, the, but this very carefully prepared one, prepared by time evolving the system forward and then time reversing, is set up in just the right way to break it. So there are going to be counterexample states. And what can we say about them in general? Just that they are going to be highly delicately and carefully structured. Um, It's tempting, incidentally, to say that they're very low probability states in some probability sense. And I want to warn against that for some conceptual reasons, but also just on a technical level, because we're mostly here talking about theories that are already formulated as probability theories or theories of mixed states. So our space of states here is a space of probability distributions or mixed states anyway. So it's not that they're low probability exactly, but they are certainly uh, yeah, well, heuristically, they're going to be, and in some cases, demonstrably, they're going to be very delicate, complicated, spe- um, carefully specified states. At least that looks like how it's going to be. All right, so then the question of why statistical mechanics works, or why high-level um, dynamics of this kind in general works, is going to be the question of why we're allowed to assume that the initial state isn't like that. And of course, if we take any given physical system, you know, the, some, some, some small mundane system like the water on my desk, it's kind of not surprising its initial state isn't like that in the sense that its initial state has been prepared by a whole bunch of other dynamical processes. So unless those dynamical processes are really, really carefully set up in a certain way, or unless the, the initial state plugged into those processes was really, really, really carefully set up in a certain way, we'd be really, really surprised to find that the... Um, that the initial state of our mundane system was one of the very delicately assembled states which counts as the exception to the usual reduction rule. And there's what we've done there. We've pushed back the requirement that the state is not careful and special in this sense back to an earlier system. And of course, and this is my justification in talking about this in a, in a um, conference on cosmology, if you keep pushing these things back, where you're going to get to is a specification of a state at the beginning of time at the beginning of the evolution of the entire system you're interested in. So claim, what we seem to get out if we look at the actual structure of reduction and emergence in physics is something, it is a claim about the initial state of the universe, but a state that's slightly different from the way it's sometimes phrased. 
we're not requiring something at the macro stage of the early universe. We're not requiring it to have low entropy. Um, we're just requiring it not... To, we're requiring something that is microstructure. We're requiring it not to be set up in, 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 in the kind of delicately correlated ways that break our general averaging um, moves. And far from, from, from this perspective, far from uh, placing, um, uh, you know, placing a condition that looks like it makes the initial universe very, very special, it's more that we're, it's more that we're, um, we're asking that it's not really, really special. Now, let me be a bit careful there, because, of course, um, if you suppose the universe is closed and has a final state as well as an initial state, then if I take my not very special um, initial state and I run it forward, precisely because that will license me to use these kind of higher level um, rules, then by those count, the final state is going to be really, really special because it, it, it's got built into it just the right correlation such that if time reversed and run backwards, it won't be governed by the macro level dynamics. It'll be governed by their time reverse. So we shouldn't, um, we shouldn't think that somehow we've dissolved away the, the, um, the, uh, the need to put an asymmetric assumption in, but, we, but claim that assumption looks sort of different conceptually, mathematically, than, than, than sometimes one gets it set up as. And so from that perspective, what do we want to say about the fact that the early universe has a very low entropy? Well, it certainly seems to be that that needs explanation, but it doesn't seem, from that perspective, to be a very different thing in need of explanation from other facts about the initial condition of the universe. So how do we learn about the fact that the universe has low entropy? By historical inference. We take the... Um, we, you know, we take the... Uh, are some possible guesses as to what the initial state is, we evolve them forward, we compare with what we have. And you know, since our, our macro-level dynamical um, theories are entropy increasing, the fact that, you know, give, given that they are correct, the fact that the early universe has a low entropy compared to the, the present-day universe um, is kind of not very difficult to, um, to get out by historical inference. So the end of that story, I think, um, just, just to sort of wrap up, is to, to suggest that this kind of way of proceeding gives us a different sort, in David Albert's terms, a different sort of transcendental assumption that we need to do to, to allow our physics to work. But it's not a, not a transcendental assumption of the kind we can actually empirically check in cosmology. It's a transcendental assumption about the fine-grained, micro-level, delicate structure of the early universe, and it's basically the assumption that it hasn't got much of it. Okay, let me stop there. Questions? Um, let's begin with. Uh, Hi, <clears throat> excuse me, David Albert. Uh, David, thank you first, as usual, for a beautiful talk. Um, I, I guess I have two small comments. One about the issue of division of labor yeah. um, that you were talking about. Here's the thing presumably, what we're interested in showing. Um, um, among the asymmetries between past and future. For example, we're, we're interested in showing not merely that the, that the epistemic access to the past is different than the epistemic access to the future for human beings or for mammals yes. or, for, or for terrestrial organisms or for biological organisms in general. The, the tendency is to think that it's something much more general mm -hmm. and much more fundamental Good. than that. So that in that sense, there is a sort of natural expectation that it should have some fairly direct link to the fundamental <sighs> physics. Yeah. If we were to encounter Martians yeah. that, that had the reversed Epistem you know, time-reversed epistemic access to us, yep. we would be flabbergasted, okay? Um, so yeah. actually it feels, it, 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 th there's a sense in which it doesn't feel like a job for neurologists or psychologists or experts in human cognition. Yeah. There's a sense in which it feels like a job for the fundamental physics. Um, that's one thing. A related point, um, the people who talk about features of the initial um, macro state of the universe um, are doing a, are, are, are trying to do a job slightly different from the one that you describe here. Yeah, that is, they're not just trying to justify the macro dynamics or, or to explain the macro dynamics. 
you know, uh, what such people are usually trying to do is something in a way more ambitious. I mean, yeah. maybe that's a foolhardy task, but they're trying to do, they're trying to both justify the macrodynamics and, and sort of systematize the whole process of inference towards past and future. So for example, um, um, on the way of reasoning that you're describing, there are a bunch of earlier states that historical inference could lead to. One is the state we think pertained five minutes ago, okay, the macro state of the world. Another is the macro state of the world we think pertained 10 minutes ago, yeah. so on and so forth, all the way back to, uh, all the, way back to the Big Bang. So, some, so, the re so I think I completely agree with you that if the task at hand okay. is just to explain the macro dynamics, you need much less than that. If the task you're looking to do is more ambitious than that, um, you may need more. Yeah. Okay, good. So um, I don't strongly disagree with any of that. I mean, just to comment quickly on it, um, I, I think it's, it's, it's absolutely right, of course, that we want a very general explanation of, um, the, of, of, of the sort of epistemic asymmetries. And I agree with you, it's a job for the physics. I suppose one way of framing my point is it's not necessarily a job for the fundamental physics. I mean, if you're like, well, what's my general kind of sketch explanation of why that is? Well, we live in a world where the degrees of freedom that are macroscopic and functional are governed by time asymmetric dynamical laws. And in a situation like that, it's unsurprising to find these kind of features. There's, fur there's further work to understand them and get, and, and get them out, but, um, uh, but it's, it's, it's not a mystery in the same sense. But having said that, to some extent, it spoils the victory. I mean, sure, if one can give that explanation directly in terms of the fundamental physics, why not? Um, as far as the other point's concerned, yeah, I don't, I don't disagree there at all. I mean... Sometimes it, it, it's sometimes said that the past hypothesis is specifically something we need to explain the fact that the, the, the statistical mechanical techniques work. That's the, the, the claim there is that, is that that's not really what's doing the work. In fact, in fact put in, in that kind of framework, what's actually doing all the work is the probability distribution over the initial macro condition, not the choice of macro condition. Um, Carlo Rovelli, um, if I had comment both talks, David and David, this morning. My comment would be that my own, uh, according to my own understanding, everything that has been said is, is right, is exactly right, as, as far as I understand. Um, which, of course, might be due to the fact that I'm sort of a gross theoretical physicist and I don't get the subtleties of philosophy. Uh, because it seemed to me, uh, didn't we know that? That's my, isn't, isn't that what what is, uh, the way we understand things. Haven't you just put things clearly what is, uh, was understood? And in fact, to some extent, was understood all the way by Boltzmann, uh, especially in what he wrote after he got all the criticisms to his age theorem. Um, and I, I, I want to, uh, to, uh, to make a point related to that. Um, First, let me say that I, I talked about the problem of the initial condition, the speciality of the initial condition in my, in my talk in the first morning. Perhaps my talk should have been after yours because the point of departure of my talk was a conclusion that the two of you arrived at. Now, of course, it might be, uh, uh, David, that... You were telling me that what I was saying was false. <laughs> no. <laughs> you, I, I was you saying were very persuasive. It was false... The, the content of you will say when you were making the argument you were criticizing. So I agree with your, uh, uh, I, I agree with your conclusion entirely. Um, but I want to, let, what I want to say is that uh, after getting the criticism for his age theorem, Boltzmann got to this point, which I think is, is, is not often appreciated, and is, is relevant in that. Um, he was thinking in probabilistic terms, he was thinking in terms of equilibrium and fluctuations over equilibrium. And what he proved, uh, no, no, sorry, what he is, is stated was the case, and in fact had been proved recently by people in statistical theory, is the following, that if you, if you take a statistical system um, uh, and, and, and you look at the fluctuations of its entropy, which of course is not gonna be uh, maximal, it's gonna fluctuate, or it's H, so the H is gonna go up and down, um, you can ask uh, why, if I'm at a certain point where I'm away from uh, the zero, from the minimum, um, one direction goes up and one direction goes down, while my theorem tells me that it goes down in both directions. 
okay? And he has an answer to that, it's a beautiful answer, it's given a value, it's far more probable, the most probable situation is that it's a peak of a fluctuation rather than, because higher peaks than that is far more probable than, uh, uh, than that. So this makes it uh, uh, clear that his own uh, um, theorem is valid uh, uh, not because it uh, breaks time reversal invariant, but in fact it confirms time reversal uh, invariant, uh, and it shows that given a situation um, uh, in which you're out of equilibrium, the most likely evolution is uh, uh, going toward equilibrium in both directions. And of course, if you use that in the context of the discussion you're going, the only way to uh, make sense of that is go back to the origin of the universe, so to making it a cosmological, a cosmological point. So I just wanted to connect this with the original. Yeah. The, theorem, the theorem has been proven quite recently yeah, in statistical mean. mechanics uh, uh, rigorously. Uh, Boltzmann just guessed it. Yeah, so, I mean, just to, to, to pick up on the first point, um, don't we all know this before? So the job of the philosopher of physics is to tell people physics they already know and then say it's profound. Um, and I'm actually almost serious about that. I'm not just being self-deprecating. I think a lot of the point of this kind of work is to sort of take things that are sort of tacit or kind of got by people and, 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 and make them and, get, and, and understand consistently and clearly what the right thing to say is. I, th I think it almost, it almost shades into pedagogy at some level. Um, but I certainly think if you look at the, um, if, if you look at what is, if you look at what is said in general terms about um, why uh, systems equilibrate, um, I do think there is a degree of mismatch between those accounts, which tend to be somewhat general and verbal, and what you actually get if you go down into the weeds and look at the way we construct and derive our detailed quantitative understanding of it. And I think that's, that, that's of some interest. And in particular, I think it's somewhat striking that um, the, role of, uh, the role of low entropy assumptions is more indirect and much less clear than, than it can seem in the general discussions. I mean, I got interested in this stuff partly, actually, because I thought, OK, um, I buy the general claim that the way to understand why statistical mechanics works is, the, is, is because the initial universe had a low entropy. So let's actually have a look at how the very, you know, I, was, I, was actually, I was actually looking at cosmology's example, examples about nuclear synthesis, but let's look at how those equations work and see where the low entropy assumption in particular is coming in. And, it did, and then it turned out to be a, more complicated than that. So that's the sort of context there. Okay, so let's take two more questions. Simon Saunders. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the value of, of your talk, David, for, for me anyway, is um, that it it seems to, to undercut a sense of mystery or some sense of strangeness or weirdness about how special the initial condition has to be. And, of course, that's been driven... I mean, if Penrose has made much of this. Um, Bernard Carr had a little diagram up from Penrose's book by Bernard. I hope you had copyright on that. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> but, um, so, uh, where it seems that, by virtue of the fact that um, the final state of the universe, given black hole and eventually black hole evaporation, at such a fabulously higher entropy than, 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 it, than it has now. And, and one sort of gets to the picture that the, the early state of the universe had to be amazingly precisely fine-tuned so as to have low entropy. And your punchline, in a way, is no, it's not that it's special, it's it, that it's non-special, right? Is that what you said? That's very controversial. I wouldn't believe it if that's what you said. Did you really say well, that? Well, no, no, let, let me carry on, because I'm, I'm presenting a gloss on what David is saying, um, and maybe David will tell me I've got the gloss wrong. So, but my understand, my gloss on what David is saying is that the initial state of the universe, far from being special, is in the sense it's precisely that it isn't at the microscopic level, carefully uh, calibrated, so as to have the sorts of... Uh, uh, coincidental relations such that you could bring together what would look to us like time-reversed re time macroscopic phenomenology. Okay. Um, and I just, I just want to push that in that if, if you imagine Penrose or some other physicist, mathematician doing some other calculation which, which shows how yet more extraordinarily special the initial state seems to have to be because uh, from entropic considerations, and perhaps the right way to think of that is what they've really shown is how extraordinarily high the final state of the universe can be. It's that the surprise is increasingly on how extraordinarily large entropy can grow through physical processes. Um, and perhaps black hole dynamics is an example of that, that prior to understanding of black holes, we didn't realize how large the entropy could get to be. Um, 
So I don't know, I wonder if you uh, would embrace that way of thinking about it. Um, I mean, I think the comeback, the pushback on that would be to say, well, okay, the initial state of the universe has to be amazingly non-special at the microscopic level. It must not have all of these careful, finely tweaked uh, relations <coughs> among the, uh, whatever it is, elementary particles and so forth. And you might say, what we're really learning is, you think you've got a non-special state because it doesn't have those finely tuned correlations. Well, guess what? It's got to be even more non-special than we thought it had to be. <laughs> that somehow, uh, so I, I just wonder which, which of the two ways of thinking will you do? Just, just, just to summarize then, is it that, so suppose we learn of some new mechanism as we did in black hole thermodynamics, such that the final state of the universe could be even more extraordinarily high entropy. Is that the surprise, the, the right way to have the surprise? Or is it Pen, Penrose's way? No, the surprise is to find how extraordinarily fine-tuned the initial state has to be so as to be low entropy. Or is the third way that I'm offering as well, is it that we learn how extraordinarily non-special the, the initial state has okay. to be? Well, I think, I think this partly trades what we mean by special. So obviously, and I take this is what's, what's worrying Don, I'm, ob I'm obviously not claiming that the, initial, that, the, that the initial macro state does not occupy an extremely small region of phase space. That's, that's clearly right. What I'm claiming is that the, th that fact about the macro state is not the thing that's really doing the explanatory work of saying why the law-like regularities of high-level system mechanics hold. Now, of course, if the, if the initial state was unspecial in the sense of being, well, these things don't have equilibrium states. This is a lot, some sort of bothers me in these conversations. If we, in, the, in a fictional world that actually had an equilibrium state, um, you know, a, a, a box-like world of some kind, then um, if its initial state was, um, was, was un unspecial in the macro sense, it would be at equilibrium, and that, that, that the macrodynamical laws held would be boring, because, you know, they, what, what do they say about equilibrium states? They say, you know, you're at the attractor, they say you should stay there. Um, but nonetheless, the thing, the thing that's doing the, the work in explaining why those, those law-like regularities run is the, is, is the non-specialness of the microstructure within that macrostate. And you, know, you, you could perfectly well imagine a universe that was actually at equilibrium, but whose microstate was extremely special in just the right ways that it went away from equilibrium. You know, take a system, let it equilibrate, and time reverse it. Um, I mean, as far as to what, what one then wants to think in this wider question of specialness, I mean, I have to confess I'm not entirely clear. I become less clear of I think more I think about it, quite what it is that's worrying Penrose in these situations. I mean, um, so, so granted, the theory that God created the universe by picking a point universe, um, uh, you know, uh, uniformly at random with respect to the Liouville measure in phase space is falsified by the data. But that wasn't a very plausible creation myth in the first place. So I'm, I not that there was a God, but the, that was how God chose the initial state. So we, didn't, we, we, we did never really had any particularly good grounds for thinking that's right. I kind of think what's going on is something like this, actually, that we have, you know, we, we generally find that the rule of saying what's, the, what, um, what's a system's microstate is, you know, we, we generally find that a really good way of doing that um, is to pick it uniformly at random in its macrostate using the Liouville measure. Um, and we have dynamical reasons for thinking that that's correct. We have, good, we have a good dynamical understanding of why it is that that method tends to get the right move. And then we're in danger of kind of extrapolating that back to a more transcendental principle, that it's a priori the case that systems, um, it, it, that the system is equally likely to be anywhere in phase space. And somehow that's our starting point, and that's what we conditionalize on. And that's what, you, and that's what gets you into the kind of skeptical catastrophe worries where we, we say that somehow um, our, 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 our memory of the past is completely unreliable because it's much, much more likely we fluctuated in from a higher entropy state. And then the, the antecedent just doesn't seem a priori very, pl very plausible. I, I don't think there are very good reasons on the table to think that it's a good a priori assumption that, the, um, that we should be uniform across phase space. There are good general a priori assumptions for um, thinking that the initial macro state should be a relatively simple, relatively easily describable state, just general epistemology, philosophy of science reasons. But of course, um, as we all know, in gravitational systems, um, that simplicity criterion tends to pick out low entropy states rather than high entropy states. So I guess in, in conclusion there, I'm just not entirely sure what the fuss is about, which is, so I'm not quite sure therefore what I should be saying in response to your sort of trilemma at the end. Okay, so what, one final comment before we break. Um, Cormac O'Rafferty, um, many thanks to both Davids for talks that are extremely clear, and that's not easy when you're going from discipline to discipline, and it's the beginning of all good arguments, I think. Um, if I could ask in that spirit a very, very simple question, which for the philosophers is probably kindergarten, you know, but would help us. Going back one chart, it would be helpful. Um, ju there's just one assumption which 
It may not be unexamined, but it certainly was unstated dur during this uh, uh, weekend so far. I mean, what do you make of Lee Smolin's view that you know n there isn't actually necessarily a tension between the fact that some of our equations in particle physics don't include time in the way that we si see time in the observable universe? And his you know his sort of simple answer to that is that what's happened is ever since the Dirac equation. Uh, physicists have been haunted by the notion that every solution has to represent the real world, whereas in fact we have to remember that mathematics is simply a representation of nature, that we've fallen into the old problem of confusing reality itself with our reputation of reality. And so in a sense, although I really enjoyed the talk, what I mean is my question is, what do you make of people who duck the whole question, who duck the whole question by saying there isn't necessarily a conflict there, this is simply a facet of the way we represent nature? Yeah. Okay, so let me say a general point and a simple point. I mean, the move of saying, well, our physics is not fully representing the world is always kind of available, but I think the only really good way to tell if... if, if um, if our physics is such that it can't represent the world, is just to try really, really hard to make it represent the world and see if we fail. I, I, th I think I was a bit nervous about the move that says, well, let's just, prime, let's just sort of a priori sort of step aside and say that um, we're not, we're, we're going to just assume that's the case. So, so that's, a, that's a general philosophical nervousness about Smelling's move. But as a more particular thing, I mean, let me, let me use that as a sort of advert for some of the ways, of, for some of the virtues of some of the ways I was thinking here, because um, the question of how we reconcile um, time symmetric microdynamics with the panoply of the observed universe is uh, it's, it's so general and has so many different facets that there's all sorts of space to say, um, uh, to say philosophical um, sort of ways out and, 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 and attempts to make the problem go away in, in, in all sorts of controversial ways of that kind. The question of how it is that we can derive, um, that we can derive the Fokker-Planck equation from um, Newtonian dynamics, given that Newtonian dynamics is time reversal symmetric and the Fokker-Planck equation isn't, um, and, and the Fokker-Planck equation is probabilistic and Newtonian mechanics isn't, that question is much tighter and sharper. And, um, and, and, and now the, the problem is not some kind of philosophical paradox. It's a straight, it's, it's a straight prima facie mathematical um, contradiction. Um, or, you know, so, so some of the assumptions in it must be, must be wrong and you, and you can push it where those are. So that's the sort of, if you like, that's the, the modesty of the suggested way I've been pushing at this um, gets some dividend here. So let's thank um, David again.